Paul Gia, and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. And then myself, who am I? Ken Ham. That's right. I was are, are you getting to that point where you can't remember? I can't remember, <laughs> yeah. Before we get to be like Ken, don't forget to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. Uh, many of you probably know of VeggieTales and the creator of VeggieTales, Paul, uh, Phil Vischer. Hey, 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 this is Paul or Phil Vischer, and uh, yeah, I'm familiar with VeggieTales. What's your, what's your point? Wow, Phil, I can't believe you're here. Yeah, hi. I never expected to see you in my studio. This is, welcome. Well, you said uh, we were, you know, there was free lunch, and so I drove to uh, Alberta for a free lunch, and I want my lunch now. Well, the show is called Ham and Egg News, so that's what we've got. There you, there you go. No veggies for you this time, I'm sorry, but that's probably what you usually get in your green room. Yeah, yeah, a whole lot of strange vegetable arrangements that I'm not very excited about. <laughs> Well, I want to welcome you to the very non-exclusive club of people who Ken Ham has called out on his Answers News show. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Does it, is there a secret handshake? Do I get a special robe or a, 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 anything monogrammed? No, this isn't the Saturday Night Live Five Timers Club. Thank you so much. Uh, it is an honor to get this from you. And I got to tell you, Alec, you have been amazing playing the president this year. Well, I can't take all the credit. I have to thank the... Um... Uh, what do you call those pale people who take the subway? Uh, uh, writers. Yes, uh, them. I love them. Oh, rats. Okay. This doesn't mean you've made it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it means I've made something. It's a something. Not everyone is in this club, well, right? Or are they? Is everyone in this club? Not everyone in this club. You actually have to catch his attention on social yeah. media and have... Offended him. Like put up a picture of him without commentary or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, Okay. I'm sorry if it's a little weird for you to be a cartoon right now. I know it takes a little while to get used to words coming in out of an animated mouth. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. So uh, this is going to be really disturbing to see my voice come out of uh, something someone else has drawn. Very, very disturbing. It's typically, though, it's, c it's computer-generated things that my voice comes out of. So hand-drawn things with my voice coming out of. That's a whole different world. We're old school here. <laughs> <laughs> it's no school like the old school. <laughs> and speaking of old school, I actually kind of think that's what Ken has a problem with. Do you have a few minutes to go through this with us? Uh, yeah, if you make me. If it's how I get my free lunch, I'll sit through it. What? <laughs> uh, has Well, he's not known for his conservative leaning when it comes to Christianity. Ouch! That's that's boo. That's that's problematic right there. I've always said I'm a conservative Christian, so there there he goes. He's thrown me under the ark before we even start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Conti I suppose it's because of my proximity and identification with Wheaton College, which he does not like Wheaton College at all. Mm. So because he doesn't like Wheaton, if you're kind of Wheaton centric or Christianity Today centric, where, you know, my podcast co-host is a former editor from Christianity Today. These are all the mainstream headwaters of the neo-evangelical movement. So what he's effectively saying here is, if you identify with the neo-evangelical movement of Billy Graham, you're not a conservative Christian. That's a little bit troubling. I predict that you and he will disagree on the word mainstream several times. Yeah, probably so. It's interesting, the Veggie, veggie Tales even had one particular section about the Big Bang. Big Bang, I remember and, that, yeah. And so on. Uh, okay, that was wrong. That was, there was no Veggie Tales reference to the Big Bang. That was in the What's in the Bible series. A uh, whole different series, whole different set of characters. And I made a Big Bang joke. It was funny because it was God, you know, God created the universe. Uh, he just spoke it into being. And then the character says he must have had a loud voice because it made a big bang. That was it. <laughs> That's cute. Good. Isn't that oh, cute? Come on. Yeah. So and, and people were actually a Christian bookstore, one particularly conservative Christian bookstore, sent back every copy of that video because of the Big Bang joke, which then I had to try to explain to people. First of all, the theory of the Big Bang came from a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's called the Big Bang was because it was an insult because people didn't like it. Hoyle didn't like it because it sounded too much like Genesis 1. So what do you think? How are you? Anyway, but VeggieTales has never made a reference to the Big Bang, so he is incorrect. 
he recently did a video, what is an evangelical? It's interesting to watch the whole five minutes of it. <clears throat> it's 22 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure what video he watched. <laughs> he only watched well, the, the whole five minutes of it. This is going poorly, Paul. In, in fair, I don't think we're going to get through this. <laughs> in fairness, he's made an entire business out of saying that 13 billion years was 6,000 years. So it's, it's numbers. Time, it's time compression. <laughs> but during that video, he actually talked about ex people who reject uh, basically mainstream science is what he says. You know, extreme positions, extremist positions. I didn't say anything about extremist positions. I just said these are some tendencies that we see more in fundamentalism than we see in neo-evangelicalism. And one of the tendencies that we see more in fundamentalism is the rejection of mainstream science. And then I needed to put up a picture of something. I actually thought about putting up a picture of an anti-vaxxer or an anti-masker. But honestly, to be perfectly frank, I have some of those in my own extended family, and I didn't want to, you know, seem like I was calling out <laughs> members of my own family <laughs> in a video. And I was like, what, what else is there? And I thought, well, there's the Creation Museum. What's funny is that he was offended by being called out as someone who rejects mainstream science when his whole last 30 years has been trying to convince Christians to reject mainstream science. They are neither Republican nor Democratic things. They are biblical things. But today, old currents of fundamentalism are resurgent. The desire to declare war on our enemies, the rejection of mainstream science, at no point in that video do you say the word extremist about no. anyone. No. So I'm an extremist because right I reject mainstream science. But you don't reject mainstream science. You reject mm -hmm. secular science. Well, that seems like splitting hairs. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, so there's mainstream science and then there's secular science. And then how many buckets does he have? Well, creationist science, but... He's not calling that mainstream. Right. And a couple of frames later in your video, you do talk about my persecution narrative. Yeah, yeah. Which he plays with a lot, in, in my view at least. So he actually doesn't like to call his stuff mainstream. He likes to pit himself as the underdog in this fight. Right. So this is a strange characterization. It is. Well, and, you know, when I debated Bill Nye on this very stage. Did you, did you ever see that Ken Ham, Bill Nye debate? Yeah, I did. Thanks. Thanks for <laughs> bringing it up. All right. The, the Ham on Nye. <laughs> You know, what he really means is, we don't believe in evolution in millions of years, therefore we reject mainstream science, therefore we're extremists. That's what he means. Right. That's what he must mean. <laughs> if you watch the whole five-minute video. <laughs> See the timestamp on the screen there? It's at 2134 out of 2239. See, and because he paused this when there was nothing on screen, this because some of his fans are just hammering me online you know, come to my Facebook page and left nasty messages, have tweeted at me with mean things. And one of, the, one of them is what you put him up on screen right next to the Westboro Baptist guys. So mm -hmm. clearly you think he's like the Westboro Baptist guys. Okay, I was putting up five different ideas very quickly in succession. The first idea was that it's a fundamentalist tendency to make enemies. Say, ooh, those are our enemies over there. We need to oppose those enemies. And you see that best picture I had access to was the Westboro Baptists creating enemies, you know, gays, you know, any, uh, the military at different times have been their enemies. So just creating, oh, enemy, enemy. Okay, that is a tendency of, of fundamentalism more than neo-evangelicalism. The next one was the rejection of modern science is a tendency of more of fundamentalism than neo-evangelicalism. So I put a picture of Ken Ham. That's up for like three seconds. And then it goes to the next one. I forget what the next one was, but then it's we actually get... an, an evil atheist. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> my people, a poster about evil atheism <laughs> and how they're, you know, coming for our children because atheists eat children, as mm. we know from the book of Hezekiah. <laughs> And then uh, after that was, uh, oh, uh, kind of a fixation with end times prophecy, mm, yep. you know, and I put up a picture of Judgment Day is, I forget, like May 11th, 2011 was right. going to be Judgment Day because, you know, we love to try to call strikes a little <laughs> too far <laughs> ahead of time. And then, oops, no, oops. that was a ball. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a ball. And so these come in rapid succession with a picture to illustrate each one. So just the fact that he stopped the video and put put up the freeze frame when there was nothing but him and Westboro Baptist Church is a really good way to say, oh, he's saying that these are two examples of extremism mm. when that w was not the purpose of the video. 
even a little bit. Sounds we like believe no the Bible, so we're extremists. Actually, I don't mind if someone calls me an extremist for believing the Bible, <laughs> because I'm going to believe God's word over man's word. Well, that's good, Kim, because I didn't call you an extremist. No one called you an extremist anywhere in the video. That's not, it wasn't about extremism, it was about fundamental, and I tweeted at him after this started. Say, the purpose of the whole video was to explain the difference between fundamentalist tendencies and then the neo-evangelical movement that tried to correct some of the fundamentalist tendencies of the early 20th century. It's a history video, and it wasn't about calling anyone extremist. It was just trying to explain the differences so pe because people are so confused about the range of supposed evangelical Christians going from, you know, <laughs> you've got C.S. Lewis on one end, and then you've got Je Robert Jeffress and Jerry Falwell Jr on the other end and everyone is saying those are evangelicals it's like well how can all of that be evangelical and to try to unpack that historically was the purpose of the whole video which is now turned into oh you think ken ham is an extremist and to be fair you are calling yourself an evangelical and creating a tent yeah. that includes ken yes yes so yes yes I'm very confused. <laughs> I'm, I am an evangelical. There is extremism within the tent of evangelicalism. There is extremism in most tents if you go out to the edges, you know, mm -hmm. especially, especially when you're in a tent that has no centralized authority structure. So it's harder to be an extremist Catholic because they'll just boot you right out because there's right. an author authority structure. You know, <laughs> you can't just, <laughs> if you, go, you completely go off the ranch as a Catholic priest, you're not a Catholic priest anymore. They're coming, they'll rip the stripes off your epaulets, and you're done, you're out. And evangelicalism, there's no such structure. So you can be, you know, a snake dancing Toronto movement where people were making animal noises and then laughing hysterically in the spirit of God. You know, you can do anything and then technically be an evangelical because there's no one to tell you you can't. It's a little bit like being a Baptist, you know, because there's no official, there's no <laughs> pope of the Baptists. Anyone can start a Baptist church or be a Baptist. And so, yeah, I think Ken is an evangelical Christian, and so am I, but, but we're fairly distinctly different streams. He is more of the Bob Jones Senior, Bob Jones Junior, Bob Jones University stream of fundamentalism, and I am more of the Billy Graham Wheaton College stream of neo-evangelicalism, which, again, was the whole point of the video. <laughs> I did a little post about that. I didn't say too much, but I, I just um, made some comments about it. And so he responded to my post mm -hmm. about my Facebook. What is interesting is to see his tweets and the tweets of some of the people that uh, responded. But you'll notice that uh, most of these tweets aren't from you. No, none of them were from me, other than just explaining what I meant. This is a controversial thing to say. The Young Earth Movement is a young movement. <laughs> and that made a lot of people go, what? That's what all Christians have believed forever. First of all, that's hard to unpack on Twitter, but you're going to get some people really mad if you point out that in 1900, almost no fundamentalist Christians believed the earth was 6,000 years old. That makes people's heads explode. <laughs> because the direction we're always supposed to be going in is from a godly Christian past to a godless secular present. And so to turn back the clock and say fewer people believed in a young earth a hundred years ago than today completely disrupts that kind of narrative of secularization. You know, that narrative of the downfall of Western civilization because of bad people, you know, them, because of the them in the enemy calling, because of the gays, because of the atheists, because of the liberals, because of the Democrats, whoever the them is. They're ruining America. Everyone took Genesis 1 literally and seriously and therefore believed the earth was 6,000 years old. Everyone used to believe that. No, 100 years ago, very few fundamentalist leaders believed that. And now many more do. So what happened between then and now is a more complex and interesting story than we've been led to believe. Like someone said, don't mess with the creationist pope. So I guess I'm called a creationist pope. Okay, if that's the first time he's ever heard that, <laughs> I would be stunned. Okay, sorry, never mind. Phil, you're going to be banned from the Creation Museum. He said, I'll sneak in the back where the dinosaurs go to poop. I thought it was pretty snarky. Yeah. It's not really becoming of him to give a response like this. No, that's funny. See, fun, funny, Ken, is what that was a joke. It was a joke because they're animatronic dinosaurs. You have animatronic dinosaurs, and I thought it was a funny idea. <laughs> 
that the animatronic dinosaurs had to go to the bathroom. So there was a special door in the back of the museum. You remember, you forgot that this is the creator of VeggieTales you're talking to, and he's known for being somewhat humorous. So the idea that there's a little door in the back of the museum where the animatronic dinosaurs go out to go to the bathroom struck me as very funny. And it was uh, my friend Drew Dick set up that joke, and I I had to be funnier than Drew was. That's always our goal is to be funnier than each other. (laughs) I watched Drew's interactions on Twitter for years. That is a high bar. Yes, it is. He's very funny on Twitter. So I, he put me up to it. It's Drew's <laughs> fault. It's Drew's fault. Peer pressure. He put me up to it. Anyway. Yeah, he'll probably take it too. Yeah. Ken Ham is without any doubt an idiot. Well, that's that's. Look, I've been called that so many times. Come up with something new. Why are we reading these? Because <laughs> he wants to show how oppressed he is. Oh, okay. So they're just emotive language fallacies where people are just basically calling names and things. That goes to show there really isn't an, a, a logical argument behind all this. No, there is no logic. Yeah, when they do that, there's no logic behind it. They just call your names and say things. Except for those tweets they skipped over. The ones that had logic. Right. And there were quite a few of those as well. And I didn't want to get into that at all because Twitter is a terrible format for trying to dive deeply into any topic. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that. So I was avoiding, you know, I'm just going to, it, it was probably a mistake to even try to engage on what did I mean when I said young earth creationism was a, a recent movement, mm. you know, and I, I, I laid out like a four or five tweet thread to try to explain that, which people jumped all over because, you know, you can't be perfect and detailed in, in a four <laughs> or five tweet thread. And actually, some people got back to me because one um, apologist, a very conservative apologist, sent my tweet thread to another very conservative young earth creationist apologist who then wrote a long blog post point by point addressing all the the mistakes he found in my... We're getting to that. Don't you worry. Okay. Great. Thanks, Paul. I didn't realize this was going to be like a this is your life of the terrible things that have happened. But look what Phil uh, Vicious said here. Young Earth creation, as taught by Ham and others. Just stop there for a moment. See, they, they accuse us of being young Earth creationists. This is what I find all the time, is that to them, oh, the most important thing we're on about is young Earth. You know, these are young Earth creationists. But that is not true. Young Earth is not the most important thing. In fact, I don't like being called a young Earth creationist for this reason. Our emphasis is on biblical authority. Right. So we're biblical creationists. Biblical that's, creationists. that's who we are. Calling yourself a biblical creationist is like just labeling your church. We're the church of God. Yeah. I'm a biblical creationist. C.S. Lewis is a biblical creationist. We, be- we believe in the Bible, and we believe God created everything. Right. So you're a biblical creationist. Uh, what he's really talking about is how do you interpret Genesis 1 and 2, and some very specific theological points of could there be death before the fall and still work out proper Christology and some other, you know, you get into some deep weeds of theology. Bottom line is there are a lot of very compelling arguments from uh, centrist evangelical Bible scholars. And it is important to remember that Ken Ham is doing science and he's not a trained scientist and he's doing biblical theology and he's not a trained theologian. So he's a, he's a hobbyist, you know, in both of these areas, uh, kind of going out on a limb and saying, I've come up with the right interpretation of Genesis 1 and anyone who disagrees with me is rejecting the authority of Scripture, which the I, I would bet money if I wasn't such a conservative Christian and believe betting is evil. I would bet money that the majority of evangelical Old Testament scholars disagree with him on his interpretation of Genesis. He says, uh, young earth creation, as taught by him and others, was born out of interpretations of a vision one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventists claimed to have had, which uh, had, was, which turned, into was turned into a book called A New Geology by one of the followers in the 1920s. And then the book inspired the book The Genesis Flood, which is written by Dr. Wickham and, and Dr. Henry Morris, uh, who I both knew personally and worked with Dr. Morris for a number of years, and Dr. Wickham was a great friend of ours. He passed away not that long ago, uh, which birthed the modern YC movement. Ken Ham read the Genesis Flood back in Australia as a youth and has been spreading it ever since. It's a surprisingly young movement. Okay, now, before he says anything else, he hates what I just said. Can I just say that? <laughs> because it implies, if you accept that, that maybe what he's been doing with his life for the last 30 years is built on a faulty premise. 
not saying the faulty premise is that maybe the earth is young, because heck, it could be. The earth could be young, and God just made it look deceptively old. You know, why he would do that, I don't know, but that's certainly possible. That's not the faulty premise. The faulty premise is that that is the only conclusion you can come to if you take the Bible seriously. And I could line up a hundred Old Testament scholars, evangelical conservative scholars that take the Bible as seriously or more seriously than Ken Ham who disagree with him on that point. So that's where I think his premise is faulty. But now you are questioning... See the arc in the background of his mm-hmm. video? See that arc? See those big pieces of wood that are holding it up so it doesn't collapse? <laughs> now you're taking a, an axe to one of those that are holding up the arc of his life's work. And that is uh, deeply troubling, which is why now, I, unfortunately, I've really aggravated him. Well, there's so much wrong in those two tweets that we could spend the rest of the day talking about it. Really but good. number one, uh, back in the uh, 1800s, 1900s, there, there were scientists, yes. um, particularly, you know, 100 years before this book was published, scientists who were defending a young earth based upon the same yeah. arguments we use from the Bible today. The young earth creation didn't come out of, those who believe in young earth didn't come out of some Seventh-day Adventist having a vision as he claims. Yes, he, he is correct about that. So my mistake and, and what other people pointed out to was the field of flood geology that existed in the 1600s and 1700s. And then it kind of died by about 1800, 1810, even among church folk. And that the young earth creationism of Henry Morris, which was inspired by the young earth creationism of George McCready Price. He was a Seventh-day Adventist follower of Ellen White. Uh, Ellen White was one of the co-founders of Seventh-day Adventism. She had visions. Her visions were considered uh, divinely inspired and therefore more or less infallible. Uh, And one of her visions was about Noah's flood and that Noah's flood was actually the source of the entire fossil record and all of the deposits of oil and coal. So the all fossil fuels and the entire fossil record were created by Noah's flood. And she had a vision of the winds after the floodwaters receded and all the dead stuff was everywhere. Great winds covered the earth and blew it all underground, like blew dirt on top of all the, the dead stuff and buried it all and built mountains and you know everything that happened happened because of these winds after the floodwaters receded and then god caused fire which reacted with limestone which started earthquakes you know and volcanoes so all the volcanic action is post flood everything like happened with the flood or post flood and she saw it in a vision And her followers in Seventh-day Adventism believed her visions were authoritative, Mm -hmm. so they couldn't question them. So one of them, George McCready Price, started working her visions because he was selling her books, the books of her visions. If you were Seventh-day Adventist, you went around and sold those books door to door. George McCready Price was selling her vision books door to door and got really interested in geology, and so started writing, kind of expanding upon her vision of a world of geology that was entirely built by its, its deluge geology, flood geology. He went to town with that and started and put out multiple books about that and then put out this book, A New Geology by George McCready Price, which was a textbook to be taught in high schools and colleges as an alternative to contemporary geology. Because contemporary geologists had discovered glaciation. They discovered there were ice ages and that, you know, the things that were carved, the old theory of flood geology was, well, maybe that was because of a deluge, a huge flood that, you know, carved valleys and shaped mountains and moved giant boulders to places where they shouldn't be, called erratic boulders, and that was all because of a deluge. By 1740, 1750, 1760, most scientists or people doing science, there weren't professional scientists yet, that was just coming into being. Most of them were clergy because they were the smartest people in a town and they had the most spare time, so most science was being done by clergy. And so they're doing it with the Bible in one hand, and then their microscope or their spyglass in the other hand. Most of them were concluding there is too much in the geological column, this record of layers going down, to be caused by one flood. Because before, for about 100 years, the theory was it was Noah's flood that did all this stuff. Right. Now, now that we're seeing all this, it was Noah's flood. So by 1800, most people have said, no, that doesn't work. But let's say, let's say Noah's flood was the last of a series 
of deluges Mm -hmm. that created all these layers. At that point, they had largely moved away from a young earth because they needed a lot more time for multiple rounds of giant floods. And Noah's flood was just the last one and the only one that overlapped with humans. So the only one in human recollection is the Noah flood. So that was the position among Church of England pastors who were doing science and Church of Scotland pastors who were doing science. As of about 1820, by 1840, even most of those guys had said, you know what, this doesn't work. <laughs> this, this, right. just, this just doesn't work. Glaciers probably did much more of this than moving water. But they'd already let go of the notion of a young earth. They weren't giving up on that idea then. They were giving up on that Noah's flood could do that much geological work around the world. And they weren't even giving up on the idea that of Noah's flood. They were just saying, this is not the cause of what we see. So by, by about 1820, 1830, the idea of a young earth had mostly disappeared among thoughtful Christians. So much so that by 1920, when we're getting close to the Scopes Monkey Trial and we're in the middle of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, the two guys that were championing the attack on Darwinism, you know, that were trying to get states to ban the teaching of Darwin in public schools, were William Jennings Bryan and William Bell Riley up in Minneapolis. William Bell Riley is called the old man of fundamentalism. William Jennings Bryan was the lion of fundamentalism. These were the guys that were championing fundamentalist Christianity and got five southern states to ban the teaching of evolution. Neither of them believed in a young earth. Neither of them believed what Ken Ham is teaching today was true because they were contemporaries of George McCready Price who was teaching young earthism again out of the Seventh-day Adventist church. William Bell Riley, I have a quote of him where he says flat out, he was aware of no intelligent fundamentalist who believed the earth is 6,000 years old. And he goes on to say, and in fact, the Bible teaches no such thing. Okay, this is one of the fathers of fundamentalism and one of the most aggressive anti-Darwinists in the first half of the 20th century, not only saying, I don't believe the earth is young, he went on to say, I don't know any intelligent fundamentalist who believes the earth is young. So that is what Ken Ham is up against when he says, if you take the Bible seriously, you can come to no other conclusion than that the earth is young. He's coming up against the champions of biblical authority in the first half of the 20th century saying he's wrong. And he doesn't have a good response for that. Sorry. Bit of a rant. But them calling me out on this is what led me to dig in and say, all right, I need to learn more about, you know, where did flood geology come from? How far back does it go? A few people have since then come back to me and said, well, yeah, but the reformers, uh, both Luther and Calvin, both said the earth was young. Why did Luther and Calvin believe the earth was young? Because there was no reason at that point to not take the most literal reading of Genesis 1. Luther and Calvin also believed that the earth was round, but did not move, because there are Bible verses that say the earth is fixed in its location. So therefore, the sun moves around the earth. They were not heliocentrists. So we gave up on that. We moved on from from using the Bible to fight Copernicus and Galileo. And why did we move on? Because the, the evidence to the contrary was overwhelming. So we realized we either needed to reject what we could observe through science, or we needed to rethink how we were interpreting a couple of key verses on that. And everybody moved on from that. And now no one is gets up in arms. Ken Ham doesn't get up in arms if you say that the earth spins and that it orbits around the sun, even though the Bible Bible says it's fixed in place. No one has a problem with that because we realize the plainest reading of those verses is not necessarily the one we should stop at. We need to go deeper. And so the whole argument here is, does the most plain reading of Genesis 1 give us everything we need to know, or do we need to go deeper? And he's holding to the absolute plainest reading, even though in his own tradition, and my own tradition of fundamentalist Christianity, a hundred years ago, almost none of the scholars held to that reading. So it's a little confusing why it has now become, what, it, what was considered non-essential has become essential today. And you can see that in the way people respond to me when I question what they consider essential and point out that it hasn't always been essential. They get really bent out of shape. One of my favorites is occasionally they go after the flat earthers. 
Ken does. And they make the exact same arguments you just made. Yeah. And just say that you shouldn't interpret these Bible verses to, to being flat earth. Right, right. Okay, William Jennings Bryan, the lion of fundamentalism, prosecuting attorney in the Scopes Monkey Trial, yep. said to believe the earth was created 6,000 years ago, that is something that our enemies accuse us of, just as they accuse us of believing the earth is flat. So it's a belief we do not hold, but we are accused of holding to be ridiculed. Mm. That's okay. That is the lion of fundamentalism who was prosecuting the Scopes Monkey Trial. And he wanted George McCready Price to testify in the Scopes Monkey Trial, but only because of his position against Darwinism. He didn't want him to bring up the young earth stuff at all because he thought that was who. (laughs) Hoo-ha. <laughs> he, thought, he thought that was garbage and more out of George McCready Price's Seventh-day Adventist past than actual science. Mm. George McCready Price started in Los Angeles in the late 1930s, the Deluge Geology uh, Association. And that was the beginning of what became creation science. Initially, it was all Seventh-day Adventists who were trying to repopularize the forgotten idea that Noah's flood could explain everything. And that idea did exist. It existed in the 1700s and the 1600s. Why did it exist then? Because people didn't have enough data to see the problems with that theory. So what George McCready Price did was say, I am going to try to come up with reasons why we can ignore the data that doesn't agree with this. You know, and the reason that Bell Riley and Jennings Bryan disagreed with McCready Price was that they thought he was closer to being a conspiracy theorist. You're not doing clear thinking <laughs> here. You know, you're, you're building a very flimsy edifice to get to the conclusion that you want to get to. So George McCready Price's Deluge Geology Society, one of the early members, one of the first ones who wasn't a Seventh-day Adventist, was Henry Morris. Henry Morris is the guy that Ken Ham just mentioned as his mentor. Right. So you can draw a direct line from Ellen White, the prophetess of Seventh-day Adventism, to George McCready Price, the author of A New Geology, to Henry Morris, who joined George McCready Price's Deluge Geology Society, and then wrote the book, The Genesis Flood, which inspired Ken Ham to move to America to work with Henry Morris in spreading uh, creation science. And creation science is going back 300 years, grabbing a theory that existed for a couple hundred years, but then was refuted, Mm. and bringing it back to life with a whole lot of energy behind museums and educational programs for kids. The reason it's so popular today is that they created homeschool curriculum that they didn't try to engage at Harvard. In the mid-1970s, Henry Morris went to Wheaton College to try to promote his ideas in in new flood geology and was disturbed that zero faculty at Wheaton College in the 1970s agreed with him. And that's why Wheaton College is not on Ken Ham's list of approved colleges that Christian kids can go to (laughs) because they never jumped on the Henry Morris Young Earth Creationist bandwagon. They never jumped back into flood geology. So to say what bothers me is when he says this is ultimately our ministry is all about biblical authority. It's, it's not. It's about flood geology. And it's about the view that this theory from 300 years ago is the only theory that comports with an honest assessment of Genesis 1, which it is not. So anyway, Henry Morris started Creation Research Institute, and that's where Ken Ham became his protege. And then Ken Ham went out on his own in 90 or 93 and started Answers in Genesis with the sole express purpose of building the Creation Museum. That was the reason he left Henry Morris to do his own thing, which is all about, we cannot convince the world of this, but if we can convince our own children of this, then they will grow up to be faithful stewards of creation science and our view of biblical authority. And that has been insanely successful. Just insanely, so many homeschool kids now show up at Moody Bible Institute or show up at Wheaton College and say, hey, where are the creation science classes? And there aren't any because that's not what most evangelical schools teach. But because they were homeschooled or went to a Christian school that used Answers in Genesis materials, they've all grown up thinking this is what you have to believe to be a Christian. And that has not been the case for 300 years. 
or some of us become YouTubers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do we have to listen to more of this? Does he say more about me? Yeah. Okay. That's just ridiculous. And then Dr. Henry Morris and, and uh, Dr. John Wickham didn't write their book because of that. Right. And I didn't believe in a young earth because of the Genesis flood. Why I believe the way I did is because I had a father who taught us to stand on the authority of the word of God. And then later on, I was able to research and get lots of information to show how we can defend our faith as Christians. So, you know, Phil Vischer is just totally wrong on that. I'm totally wrong on that. He also basically described your second model parents taught this to children. Yeah, no one went to college and, and learned creation science because no even Christian colleges didn't teach it. And Henry Morris was a civil engineer, you know, so no one involved in this new field up until recently had a degree in the field they were in. Mm. You know, just like Ken Ham doesn't have a Bible degree or a science degree. He was an educator. So it's a little concerning that it's characterized as was standing on the authority of the Bible. It's like, well, no, you're standing on one way to read one section of the Bible that has never been, you know, go back to Augustine. St. Augustine technically believed the earth was probably thousands of years old, but believed God created everything in an instant. Didn't think the six-day creation was literal. You know, that's 300 AD. So questioning how to read Genesis 1 goes back to the very birth of, of Christianity. Mm. You know, when someone says, we just read it the way it says. We read it this way. Well, okay, Paul says that if you're a man, you should never pray with your head covered. So if you read that at, as, at the most surface level, you can never pray wearing a hat. You can't. It's sin to pray wearing a hat. Now, people that are thoughtful say, I wonder if that's what he meant. And I wonder if what this meant to the original audience. And this is, you know, John Walton is a friend of mine, and, and John Walton is, is one of Ken Ham's biggest targets as an enemy because he wrote the, the Lost World of Genesis 1, which completely undermines Ken Ham's reading of Genesis 1 from a very— and John Walton is one of the most respected Old Testament scholars within evangelicalism. He teaches at Wheaton College, taught at Moody Bible Institute before then. So, you know, he will say very clearly the authority of Scripture is in the relationship between the original author and the original audience. So if you're trying to understand one of Paul's letters, you want to know what was going on with that original audience, say the people of Ephesus or the people of Thessalonica, and what was going on with Paul at that point. And the closer you can get to understanding that context, because the Bible isn't written to us, it's written for us. So Paul's letters were not written to me. It's not, you know, Paul's epistle to Phil. It's Paul's epistle to the Thessalonians. So if you want to understand what he's saying, you want to know what was going on in Thessalonica at that time that he might have been responding to. And the closer you can get to that, the more confident you can be that you're reading it correctly. The same thing is true of Genesis 1. You want to get as close as you can to how did people of the ancient Near East think when they thought about creation, when they thought about the origins of everything. You know, and some of the biggest clues are the Bible doesn't start creating from nothing. It starts creating from chaos. Mm. It's, you know, the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. The deep, the ocean, was a metaphor for chaos. Chaos was like the ultimate evil. The ocean was the ultimate evil. Because you go out on the ocean, you never know if you're going to come back alive. You know, before you have radar and weather forecasting, any trip out on the ocean was potential death. Because that was just chaos. Which is why in Revelation, there's no ocean. There's no ocean in Revelation. In the new heavens, new earth, there's no ocean. Does that mean there's no water? No, it means there's no chaos. That's what, what the, the Bible is saying. We go from all chaos, and that's where it starts. So people in the ancient Near East didn't think about, well, where did the biology come from? Where did the molecules come from? Where did hydrogen come from? That is not how ancient people thought. Ancient people were asking the question, who ordered the chaos? And Genesis 1 is very likely answering questions that the original audience actually would have been asking, exactly. not answering our questions as modernists who are responding to Darwin. Oh, anyway, and that's what guys like John Walton have done really great scholarship over in saying what questions would they have been asking that the original author would have been answering. And let's not force the text to answer questions it's not asking. I mean, if you go back to the Bible, God created everything in six days. I mean, you not, not only do you see that in Genesis, but we see that in Exodus 20, verse 11. That's part of the Ten Commandments that God directly etched. Okay, one of the most respected and most recent evangelical study Bibles is the ESV study Bible. If you go to that Exodus passage in the ESV and go to the study notes and say, what does this mean? The study note says, what it means here is whatever it meant in Genesis 1. <laughs> 
That's awesome. <laughs> that, that is the evangelical scholarship position. This is not making a statement separate from Genesis 1. It is repeating Genesis 1. So whatever Genesis 1 means is what this Exodus passage means. You can't use the Exodus passage to say, now we know how to interpret Genesis 1. It doesn't work that way. What makes that more delicious is that ESV is the official translation of Answers in Genesis. Is it? Yes. Oh my goodness. I actually run through a number of chronologists over the past 2,000 years who arrived at an age of the earth just a matter of thousands of years ago. And it's the majority of them. I have over 25 of them listed there. I've actually tallied it up. Over 25. I'm not sure 25 would be the majority of... <laughs> of any people. It, although his point may be that not that many people set out to come up with an exact date of the earth, you know, based on the Bible. So it may be that the majority that tried to use that, do that using the Bible came up with, you know, like Bishop mm, Usher, sure, right. you know, in, in the 1600s, who came up with an exact date, like May something, you know, 4004 right, BC, yeah. I, I think it was 3 p.m. or something like that. Yeah, 3 p.m. That's when it, that's when it went down. That's when it went down. So, yeah, but again, between 1830, and, whoops, and roughly 1960, very few prominent Bible scholars believed the earth was young. And today, I can't think of a whole lot of prominent evangelical Bible scholars who think Ken Ham is reading Genesis 1 correctly, including the editors of the ESV. To say that the uh, believing in a young earth comes out of some Seventh-day Adventist vision or something like that is it's ridiculous. Just false, yeah. not what I was saying. Not what, that was not my point. My, my point was the resurgence of flood geology comes out of Seventh-day Adventist vision, and flood geology led to the Deluge Society, which led to Creation Science Research Institute. There's a colorful history about how that became Answers in Genesis, but we will leave that for another day. You can, Yeah, you can do that some other time. I also put on my blog an article by Dr. Jason Lyle, mm -hmm. who's a creation scientist, who goes through and refutes all of Phil Vicious comments in a very detailed and very... Uh, very careful way. He sure does. And I actually learned a little bit from that, which led me to do some more research, but also to respond to him to say, and yet I don't believe you've shown that any of the fundamentalist fathers actually believed in a young earth, even though you claim you have, but I don't think you did. And here's some examples of the key fundamentalist fathers explicitly refuting a young earth, and he never responded to that. You'll see that false and just so you know, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Jason Lyle is an astrophysicist. So here's an astrophysicist with a PhD taking Phil Vischer to task on the issue of science. So it really is pretty okay. powerful response. Okay, 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 okay. What he took me to task for <laughs> <laughs> was church history. So why an astrophysicist is more qualified on church history than someone else is uh, another issue to, to bring up. And, and it was specifically on the question, did any of the fundamentalist fathers believe in a young earth. So why an astrophysicist is qualified to discuss the theology of church fathers is a little funky. Okay, so Jennifer, speak. Yes. <laughs> well, I think you're off the hook now because that's the extent of they're talking about you. Oh boy. Yeah. So that led to more than a few people showing up on my social media to tell me how bad I was to be attacking poor Ken Ham. Why are you attacking poor Ken Ham? Why don't you believe the Bible? Like, oh, do we, you really want to, do I have to unpack this? <laughs> yeah. No, this, uh, we're doing a whole podcast episode on the history of Ken Ham creationism that actually comes out in, in, um, before the end of 2020. It will come out, and it's an hour of walking through the history of flood geology and how it came and went and then came again in a vision of Ellen White and then was turned into a textbook, which was turned into a book, which was turned into a society, which was turned into a homeschool movement, which was turned into a whole lot of people now that are mad at me. <laughs> well, I'm sure this will do nothing but help. How, Nothing but how, help. How could anyone Nothing. possibly be confused? Nothing but help. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Was, I'm so glad. Where's my lunch now? You yeah, said I, I could I put it right. there. I think it's time to put, put this ham and egg away. Let's go get lunch in the green room. Uh, an entire spread of non-vegetables for you there. And will you come to the uh, Creation Museum with me and we can sneak in the back door where the dinosaurs <laughs> go out to poop? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I actually know where that is, and we can do it right Okay. Now. <laughs> That's great. For that History of Creationism podcast, a slew of incredibly thought-provoking videos, 
I highly recommend Phil's race relations series and timely topical articles. Check out Phil's website, holypost.com. Or just throw in one of your old VeggieTales DVDs and listen to the tomato. Okay, thanks, Paul. And as always, a huge thank you to my patrons and those who support the channel. My plans include doing even more in 2021, so if you're willing and able to join them, please check out the support links in the description. The annual Hammy New Year special is coming soon, but until then, check out this playlist for some of our best ham and egg episodes. See you over there. Later. Bye.